Thanks for staying with us. Uh, just before this time, uh, we saw the quote of the day, and it was to take care of your body. It is the only place that we have to leave. And it was very, very deep. Uh, I, if I ask you a simple question, when was the last time you went to the hospital? I wonder what your uh, answer would be. To a lot of Nigerians, it will be, ah, no, I never go to the hospital. I'm never sick. It's just headache sometimes, and I take paracetamol, and that's the end of it. And to some people, if you tell them to go to the hospital, they will tell you that uh, when I go there, they are going to discover so many things I don't want to hear. Would you rather just pass out uh, without... Uh, uh, even when you have the opportunity to correct whatever may be wrong in your body. So every once in a while, please do that checkup, no matter how small, no matter what about, but just do that checkup and make sure that your body is uh, fit for the next day uh, because we don't want people just breaking down, just passing out, just uh, uh, falling down and before we know it, they are six feet, feet under the ground. A lot of things are wrong with us and we have to be sure that we're taking care of ourselves. Let it not be said that it was our fault that whatever happens to us happens to us. Okay, it's time now to look at the papers and uh, we've been joined by Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner here in Lagos State. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Kolawole. Good morning, my brother. Thanks for having me. Good. Okay, we're looking at the papers this morning, and we're beginning with a Guardian newspaper. Uh, the Guardian newspaper begins with uh, a story on uh, seven states on Niger borderline. Bandit smugglers reign as sanctions hardship ground communities. That's the headline in the Guardian newspaper. So, it appears uh, the sanctions on the, our, our sister country, uh, are affecting Nigerians as well as Nigerians? Well, that's uh, the truth. Banditry uh, has become a uh, transporter issue uh, in West Africa. And not even just West Africa alone. One can see almost all over the world. The borders have become so porous. And all these bandits and criminals just move from one place uh, to the other. And know that. And unfortunately for us as a people, the requires would appear to have uh, uh, broken down. Uh, three of South countries, I think, Mali, Niger, and uh, the Ivory Coast or what? Or Burkina Faso. They've uh, pulled out of the requires now. And so, Fighting these uh, transborder crimes and all that becomes a lot more uh, difficult. And uh, but somebody, but like somebody has said, when you look at the banditry that we have in this country today, whether it be urban banditry or a kind of a rural banditry, you will find that that they are also uh, uh, homegrown, uh, locally made with our uh, people. That are expensive for some of these things. So if the banditry is homegrown and all that, we should be able to find homegrown solutions uh, for this transporter uh, uh, crime. Too many lives are being lost, too many properties are being and uh, are being destroyed. There is so much helplessness uh, uh, among the people. Food security is uh, in, in jeopardy because of this, uh, because of the uh, banditry. So. Again, too, it's become a very, very serious challenge to the security people, whether they be in the army, the navy, and what are they? Uh, so that um, much of the effort that they are making seems not to be using the desired um, the result. But I am of the opinion that we can overcome this thing, that Nigeria can defeat the bandits, and then the, the nation become healed, and then we're able to move forward and want to get. Mm. Okay, in both the Punch and the, the Daily Trust newspaper, we have a kidnapping epidemic. Uh, now, that's what we're calling it. It's an, epi it's an epidemic in, uh, in Nigeria. Abductors demand 100 million for Ikiti school children and uh, teachers. And the writer is that police, NSCDC, Amotekun, OPC, hunters form joint tax force, arrest five suspects. 
the, the brazenness with which these uh, people are demanding for money, it's, it, it's terrible. A hundred million for students, for pupils that were abducted. I don't know why they are so confident nowadays and they are doing what they're doing, asking for amounts of money that Nigerians ordinarily cannot raise. Honestly speaking, you will recollect that uh, last week we discussed something along this um, line mm. that the kidnappers have become very, very audacious, mm. that they even have notices in the community that they are coming to attack and abduct uh, uh, people. They also direct the people paying the ransom to go and pay to certain banks and war at them. So when kidnappers become that audacious and they can tell you, and direct to bring ransom to certain places and also go and pay into the banks and all that. He must have been doing this because they know there's never going to be consequences, that they will never be arrested, that they will never be punished for their crimes and war again. And then uh, you begin to wonder where is this obesity coming from? Why have these people become this uh, aggressive uh, and demanding? And then how can we really find solutions to these uh, problems and war again? Like I argued like, when last we discussed it like this, I would want to say that um, unemployment has been contributing to this uh, situation. And it shouldn't be an excuse. I'm not saying that because people are unemployed, they should take to criminality and whatever. Furthermore, it would appear that technology is also contributing. Why the security people are using technology to track uh, the criminals and what have you, those who are engaged in this. Due to the criminals are also deploying technology to carry out their nefarious um, activities. Of course, we also recall that I said, or I argue, that the sensation of life that the politicians are living, that the civil servants are living, that the artists among us, the musicians and the footballers and what have who buy those stories and make that they are these mansions and advertise this on social media. Is foiling uh, all this criminality like kidnapping and also Yahoo Yahoo and then the uh, money making uh, uh, rituals. So, uh, if we are going to come on top of all these things and not necessarily kidnapping, especially to regards to all the false force that we are made in the past, figures have been deployed, policemen have been deployed, DSS officials have been deployed, and what have you. And Mateko has been formed, Eastern Nigerian Security Network. Have been found in some of these places. Still, they are able to arrest this deplorable situation of kidnapping and insecurity. So, we require to have a holistic approach to it, creating jobs for people, also deploying more cutting technology and all that. And also engaging the youth in terms of the civic education, in terms of religious education, in terms of parents uh, educating their children on the need to disease of criminality and the kidnapping. Because no matter how intelligent, no matter how smart you are, no matter how um, brave you think, sooner than later you are going to be caught um, when you engage in this and, and, and the kidnapping and all that. So the youth are to be up, uh, we have to appeal to the youth to disembark from this perilous effort. You must also begin to engage the youth in such a manner that um, the devil will start finding um, a job for the idle hand among our youthful population. A newspaper where we have a direct consequence of security or, or a failure in security or insecurity in the country. Now, uh, tuition yeah. fees hike imminent as private schools spend fortune on security. Now the schools themselves have to be the ones that will secure them and their uh, pupils or their students. And because of that, tuition fees are likely to go up. Most of these things have uh, the ordinary may or should, uh, we should. We could get that they will have their band work on the set. The society is a chain. When one of the weak links in the chain is broken and all that, and sooner than later, it will affect all the other aspects of, uh, of uh, the chain. Say, for example, this uh, bandits, rural bandits, for example. I mean, we could not have anticipated that it's going to have very serious consequences, such as it has had on food, uh, on food um, 
and security. So that is the way things uh, work out. We just more break this vicious circle of insecurity so that uh, people can uh, move forward and the people can begin to do or sleep with both eyes closed and will have the opportunity to move around, not just to go to farms, to go to schools, but to even um, travel around the country like we used to do. With regard to the schools and all that, yes, I'm aware that the schools are now spending a fortune on security. Say, for example, most of them are now building walls, fences around their schools. The implication of that is that the schools are, again, also becoming a prison and all that. In addition, you find out some of these schools now installed CCTV, security cameras, hire and deploy more security men and all that. The implications are very, very great. When you spend more money providing security, that will, at the end of the day, translate to, to, to school fees. The proprietors of those schools increase the school fees and all that to be able to recoup their money and then provide security to the children that are in school. So it is not a win-win situation for us as an individual. The security people must just put on their thinking cap and break this vicious cycle of insecurity. This axis of violence that has been reached on our people. And we will not be able to break it until the Nigerian position begins to have a change of mind. Hmm? That uh, some of the things they do, the intervention life they lead, the national resources, the large chunk of the national resources that they allocate to themselves to be able to enjoy or live the civilian life they are living. They must be ready to do some of these things. They must be made ready to make sacrifices. They must also be ready to tighten their own belts, just like the ordinary men on the street uh, are doing. After all, the bandits are human beings too, and when they collect this money, they don't spend it in the bush. It is in our main thing, it is in the city, in the towns and the villages that they spend the money. That tells us that the, the bandits, the kidnappers, they are not ghosts. They are human beings like any other uh, person, like any of the other ordinary children uh, that we have um, within us in our houses on a daily basis. Well, um, we have um, an arm of the uh, NBA or lawyers also calling f uh, the, on the president to declare a state of emergency. Civil Society Legislative Advocacy, Advocacy Center, uh, known as CISLAC, has called on the president to, um, to declare a state of emergency on, on security. We also have this headline still on the Guardian newspaper, which is saying uh, Senate has summoned once again the security chiefs uh, to a meeting. Senate summons service chiefs over insecurity. So what's, is this all, are this all doing any good for us? Uh, every day the security chiefs are being summoned and summoned and summoned. We, we don't seem to see any improvement in the security situation. Is a state of emergency the way to go? I don't think so. When you declare a state of emergency, and what have you, what means is that you are breaking the fundamental rights of the people who live in the state of in the environment, in which a state of emergency has been declared. What you are doing is giving the security people a kind of good powers, authority to deal with the security challenges they may be confronted with. And when the security people use a legal means, and know that most times it becomes an infringement on the right of the people. People will be killed, people will be detained or kept in custody uh, without uh, following the due process of law. And of course, so many other ugly things will happen when you declare a state of emergency. So I don't support it. And we have even the past the state of emergency in different parts of the country and all that. And what we have is helped us to elevate or provide a solution. To the security challenges that we have in our hands. I don't think that is the solution. And when you also look at the nature of the security challenge that we have in there, they are not amenable to a state of security, I mean to a declaration of a state of emergency. You are talking about kidnappers who live in the bush. So when you declare a state of emergency or not, you will be declaring in the towns, in the villages, and in the hamlets and the cities and all that. You will not be able to declare a state of emergency in the thick forest in which these kidnappers uh, they operate 
and what I do. Rather, mm. uh, I will want to see a situation which will strengthen the security group. They have already said two things. For more than two years now, the security people have been battling the Boko Haram with uh, almost uh, their hands. The kind of um, equipment that they should have, the kind of motivation that we should give them, we are not providing it for them. And the security people are human beings themselves and all that. We don't expect them to go and start uh, combating or confronting kidnapper with their hands and then on empty stomach and what happens. Let's get our uh, property right and what happens. Because for me, we are not getting it right here. We devoted too much attention to politics, to politics and what happens. Almost 19 and 5 percent of the resources of the nation have been expended on security. I mean, on, 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 on politics. If we deploy half of that uh, resources, to tackle new security, to tackle unemployment, and what are they? To ensure we have uh, motor bureaus all over the country and what are To ensure that we keep the children off the street and off criminality and what are I am sure we will be better for it uh, as, as our people. I sympathize with the security people. They are in the rural areas, they are in the forest, they are in the city, they are on the road, combating criminality in the different parts of the country. In the South East, they're losing their lives to hype of and all manners of the criminals in those places. So, if this be the case, a declaration of a self agency is really not, not the solution. But to have a kind of holistic approach, a very, very total and holistic approach to find a solution to this criminality, to find it to the kidnapping that we have uh, now in Nigeria. Imagine two uh, robbers uh, in the city state were brutally murdered uh, this uh, uh, past uh, one week. How do you fathom that? And those bills of bars are like God. You dare not go near them. You kill them with hours. But people can now stop up bars on the road, kidnap them, and kill them. Army general, army general, police uh, uh, commissioners and um, IGs and others are also being kidnapped. Honestly speaking, what all these points are to is. Um, it's a failure. Nigeria has already manifested the failures of, um, of a failed state. And the earlier we arrest this situation, the better for us as our people. Hmm. Okay, um, to other matters. Um, now, let, let's begin with sign executive order on unexplained wealth, Ndume tells Tinubu. Uh, let me combine that with um, uh, something that a lot of people will see as some kind of gain. Nigeria ranks 145 on Graft Index score, uh, Graft Index score 25 out of 100 points. Okay, so your comment on this, uh, it seems like we are moving up a little bit, uh, but 25 out of 100, that is 25% of uh, whatever assessment Sorry. that is being used. In what uh, paper did you pick that? The Guardian newspaper, is still on the Guardian newspaper. Okay, okay, Nigeria okay. ranks 145 okay, I can see that on Graft Index. Take that again, take that again. Nigeria ranks 145 on graft index, score 25 out of 100 points. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, we don't even need any international organization to tell us um, where we stand in terms of corruption in this country. The indices are staring us uh, in the face. Like I say, what you require to do is look at the cost of contract in this part of the world. Cost of, cost, cost of contract is highest in Nigeria when you compare it to some other parts of the world. When you compare it to some other West African countries. When you compare it to some other poor countries and what happens. And it's basically the same material that is going to be used for this contract. So why is it the highest here in Nigeria? And again, too, look at the kind of money that we are spending on the politicians that are unaccounted for in terms of security votes and war at all. Ordinarily, my own understanding of the law is that whatever money is appropriated from the national resources is accountable. So we are the governors, we are the local government chairman, we are the vice president, the, the president and all that have gotten their own law that say security votes should not be accounted for. This is my own imagination. 
at the end of the day, when you find out, security for, for example, is in near extremism, uh, a legalization of, um, of uh, corruption. Again, during the recent, we look at the kind of money that has been done to verify um, uh, information as regards uh, the poor citizens or the poor people in the country. Millions and millions of uh, of of uh, naira, money that is even more or that is even higher than what you want to spend to alleviate the poverty for the people you say you want to rescue from um, from the poverty. So, and then again, this last week, the chairman of EFCC came out to say that um, some operatives of the EFCC now take a bribe to frustrate the investigation of a, of a suspect. So, these are entities that are staring us in the face that are very clear. And we don't need any international organization to really tell us um, where we stand. It's regards to corruption and transparency. And it's because unfortunately, most unfortunately, I know that. Uh, there isn't, uh, fair to say, any point out to be said that things will change uh, for the better in the nearest future, simply because businesses are nearly being done by politicians, by businessmen, by civil servants. In the way and manner, they have always been doing it, and which have put us in this kind of shit hole, or in the shit hole that we have found ourselves. It's been business as usual, across the board. Okay, so you subscribe to what Ndume is saying, that uh, there should be a law uh, for unexplained wealth. He said, sign executive order on unexplained wealth. Ndume tells Tinubu, you agree to that? I don't agree with all these um, executive order, no executive order thing. No, no. Now, let's uh, use this hypothesis. If you sign an executive order and know that, or non explain them um, away, and then the police people would um, ensure compliance, the DSS will enforce compliance. The ESCs that will enforce the compliance and all that are themselves uh, partakers uh, in the corruption. How would we be able to enforce the executive order with regard to unemployment, unexplored uh, the work? Besides, we are not too good or we are not too comfortable uh, in generating data and uh, using data in this uh, part of the world. How many of our businesses, how many of the so called millionaires that we have in our midst and all that? can uh, keep the uh, adequate uh, records of their business transactions uh, and all that. And even if they do, uh, do you have the mechanism and the machinery and the way we to ensure compliance, to, to get people to comply with understanding them the work? The answer is uh, no. Most times uh, when people uh, steal money and pay the money on do for misappropriation of public funds and all that, some of these monies are not even taken to the bank, for example. Most times they are changed to dollar pounds selling and all that. And then hidden in safety tanks or in some holes that have been dug in the private investment of some people's homes and what have them. So, and you will recollect, we once had a situation in this country in which a pastor of um, uh, one of the foremost uh, Pentecostal churches and all that uh, was sitting on billions of uh, Naira dollars and what have And when you see this man, you hardly would believe or know that he is a billionaire. He dresses in rags, he lives a low profile, he flies economic class when he is traveling and what have But when he suddenly died and all that, the cat was let out of the bag and then uh, his honest plain work now came into the, into the open. The executive order or no executive order, I don't think it's a solution. We have enough law in this country to really cut off with whoever will be accumulating wealth in an unlawful manner. The challenge has always been the enforcement of this law. Too many laws doesn't lead to, to compliance. In fact, when you make too many laws on the same issues and all that, people will begin to ignore those laws. People will begin to talk with them because um, uh, the impression you will be taking uh, closely out there is that uh, you don't know what you are doing. And I've also said one thing in the past, which I want to repeat another. A lot are not supposed to be encyclopedia 
or a kind of manual uh, which everybody begins to carry around uh, like a sacrificial, like a Bible uh, for, for behavior, for relationship with people and whatever. Some of these issues are better handled morally and uh, ethically than just making law to confront all problems and challenges that we have in our world. It doesn't work that way. Hmm. Okay, um, Labour is saying 200,000 minimum wage is no longer realistic. What's your comment on that? The, the, the committee has been set by the, the presidency. Workers demand living wages as federal government unveils negotiation committee. Uh, in another news, Daily Trust, they say uh, that um, Tinubu tax minimum wage committee to dialogue in good faith. But we're taking this uh, story that, that is from uh, the, the Punch newspaper now. 200 naira, uh, 200,000 naira minimum wage no longer realistic. That's according to Labour. What's your take? Well, I agree with Labour. Even if uh, an employee is paid up a million naira per month today, how does that solve their problem? Say, for example, the legal environment and not that. Uh, in most parts of um, the high areas like in the city, like Suruburi and what up in Kenya and all that. The room and palace have contained now goes for 750,000 naira per, per month. So if a man in Lagos is any um, 500,000 naira per month and he has school fees to pay, transportation to make, feeding to do, uh, 10 people who are dependent on him and all that, how would the 200,000 naira, even the 500,000 naira that I have proposed uh, solve their problem? Besides, no. Then take a uh, cast of mind back to what has happened in the past. These time salaries have, all, have been increased in this country. Has he ever solved the problem of inflation? Has he ever solved the problem of elevating the poverty of the people? The answer is no. In fact, things get worse. Because only a fraction of those who work for the government are paid this uh, minimum uh, wage. And many of they are paid, the ordinary person who is not earning the minimum wage, who is a petty trader, who is a transporter and what have he also hikes the cost of his goods and uh, services. And he hikes, he hikes it and all that. Population becomes the order of the day. And poverty is um, elongated. I would want to see a situation in which um, we look at some other ways of uh, solving the problems of um, people's uh, wages not uh, taking them home. For example, you can subsidize their schools instead of increasing school fees by the universities and polytechnic are doing. Let the uh, further cost them uh, down and whatever. Uh, transportation. Uh, we can reduce the cost of uh, transportation. Uh, one good thing the federal government did during the last uh, uh, salary break, they deployed the Nigerian railway to carry people to some destinations in the country. Every child that is going to school that uses the railway, that uses them. Um, the public transportation, like the PRT, they will use those facilities uh, uh, free of charge. Or tickets will be sold to them at a considerably lower uh, rate, a kind of uh, special ticketing for children who go to school, for old people in our midst, and for the unemployed people. We can also uh, begin to create food banks uh, where people are unemployed, where people are indigent can have at least one good square meal in a day. I'm not talking about uh, uh, cooking food in the schools like they've been doing. I'm also not talking about um, distributing uh, one Congo of rice for about 500 or 300 people. And then you say that you are helping them to elevate uh, the poverty and solve the problem. Like we could have a situation in which some of these trees will be contracted. You will have a special design, a special package, a minimum of um, certain food packages and all that. Do some of these issues will be, be given out to so certain people who will be registered in the food bank. And then the federal government will be saying the average of those food, um, that to those uh, issues and whatever, depending on the number of people that have been listed uh, over there. With that situation, the indigenous people in the society will get uh, good and clean food to eat and water. That would also help those businesses, the nutrients that we have that will be part and parcel 
of uh, that uh, food uh, supply uh, uh, chain. And uh, of course, too, let's begin to subsidize agricultural inputs, agricultural tractors and inputs that the farmers um, are using. We could also have provision for the farmers to be able to buy farming equipment and treatment in a very, very cheap uh, manner. That kind of approach uh, might uh, be more helpful than increasing the salaries and wages of the few civil servants that we have at the federal level, at the state level, at the local government level. We had a Udoji windfall in this country, in which people just received the money, and started buying electronics and then the cars and whatever. By the time all the households got to see with electronics and all that, they began to face the challenges of power supply. Because the demand for power also skyrocketed or became a strong maker. When we did not plan for the power suppliers to really expand their, their plant and facilities to be able to cope with the high number of electronic gadgets that people got increases in salary and wages began to fire and install in their homes. Well, I, I agree with you that the uh, solution to the problem is not just increasing the minimum wage because at the end of the day, like I usually say, you're increasing the minimum wage and the traders on the roadside are listening. The landlords are listening. Everybody is listening. Some of them exactly. are also even workers. So they know when this minimum wage is, is increased. And then it's just a fraction of the Nigerian population that works for the government that will be affected. Exactly. With this. Okay, but now um, Naira plunges in uh, official market. Uh, CBN wants Forex dealers. Let me combine that with the fact that IMF foresees weaker growth, I'm sure, for our economy. So Naira keeps plunging, and we were told that whatever policies have been done, have been put in place, will make the Naira stronger and stronger. It's now going, and some people are looking at the fact that maybe before the end of this year, we're going to have Naira to a dollar, 2,000 Naira to one dollar. And there's no indication that it is going to be a lie at the end of the day. It's going to be worse than that. I'm sorry I'm being pessimistic. Uh, it's going to be worse than that. You are now know the basing is this a basing wood economic theory that uh, when um, uh, two goods and services are chasing uh, the large volumes of money, what you get is a kind of um, inflation. He also tells us that uh, what determines the strength of uh, the nation's currency is a uh, productive uh, base. The number of goods and services that you will uh, provide in that environment, in that uh, country. Look at the number of co uh, companies that have left Nigeria that have shocked that, and which facilities have been taken over by the churches and what have you. Just imagine uh, the numbers and what have you. So, if um, companies are leaving Nigeria and shutting down their plants, manufacturing are not uh, taking place and what have you. How are you going to send in the value of the Naira? This uh, much, I uh, mean, uh, will beat my imagination. In fact, my suspicion is that uh, if we are not careful, sooner than later in a very short while, the Naira will become like the Zimbabwe dollar, in which when you want to buy ordinary tomatoes, you have to go to the market with millions of Zimbabwe dollars to be able to buy ordinary tomato. And that is beginning to happen. A billionaire, a housewife, once complained not too long ago that a basket of tomato in the northern part of the country where tomato is sold is now sold for thousands of naira uh, in that part of the world. When you go to the Lagos market too or the southern market too, the situation may not be too uh, different. So, uh, the prediction that our growth rate is going to be about 3% yeah. is uh, coming you know, this year and all that. It's not perfect. I, it's not important that it, it could even be worse uh, than that if no efforts have been made or if we are not making serious efforts to really resuscitate, to revitalize, to kind of ignite the productive base of the Nigerian economy. And what is the productive base? Manufacturing, agriculture, uh, mineral uh, resources um, exploitation, beneficiations, and then uh, sales in the international market. And of course, too, diversification of the energy needs of the country. 
you need to also begin to embrace the blue energy, alternative energy sources, instead of using the whole dependency on, on fossil uh, petrol. Who is been saying, sooner than later, will be obsolete energy, obsolete technology, coal that nobody wants to have anything uh, to do with. So, if uh, the World Bank or any of these other agencies don't need to tell us, these are things that we already know. But if we already know it, what are we doing to ensure that the growth rate in Nigeria is not, uh, does not remain at 3%? that the uh, manufacturers don't start shutting down their plants and they're leaving the country. This is what we should be addressing. We currently spend as much as 70-75% uh, of the natural resources on the politics. And you and I know politics does not add any value for any GDP in the nation's economy. Wow. I wonder where we're headed, and we're hoping that we're going to get to a destination we will all be proud of. Okay, um, uh, now we have uh, a daily trust. Airlines differ as CBN claims Forex backlog cleared with $64 million. We, we had this time that we, we were told that this backlog uh, was cleared, and we thought that was the end of it. But right now, airlines are saying it's a different story. Uh, they have the inside story. I don't know what you think about this. Is the CBN telling lies or they're telling half-truths? Are the airlines being greedy and also are they the ones that are telling the lie? I don't even know what, what it is right now because it's affecting our economy as well. <laughs> the, the airline couldn't have been telling lies. They say you know it or you face it, know it all. They are the people who use our pension them. So if the creditor is saying, look, contrary to what you are saying, I am not being paid the backlog of the money that you are owing me. I don't think the airline could have been lying or telling um, the nation, the Nigerian people, a different story. Most times when people in government speak, they speak with the team of the business. The philosophy that they must give hope to the people. Now, when you let the people know some of these things, uh, the fact reality of what is happening, it could lead to despondency and also let people losing faith in the entire system. Uh, but sometimes it will be better to be honest with the people, to let them know what is really happening so that they will. Um, Get ready for the stormy ride that they are likely to, to go through. Because uh, when you lie, sooner than later, like the Yoruba people will say, if a lie has been uh, flying or on your traveling for a thousand years, most times you take just one day, just one leap for the truth to catch up uh, with it. And if they see the answer, they Hello, Mr. Kola so, Wale. Yeah. I mean, but we must also occupy the, the very difficult task of letting people know the reality of what is happening with regard to the economy, with regard to politics, and with regard to security. Mm. Okay. Um, the second to the last headline I'm, I'm willing to take on uh, this segment will be from the Federal Capital Territory. Wiki approves 30.9 billion naira for rehabilitation of schools. Mm -hmm. You're laughing. That's another... Uh, you know, we just talked about the cost of contract mm -hmm. in this uh, part of the world. Billions to rehabilitate schools. When you say you are rehabilitating schools, you are not saying you are building a new world, no. What you are saying, you are going to And when you say, you need, you need things. You need to provide a better, or get a newer furniture and whatever. And then you keep the light. Is that what we are spending billions of uh, Naira uh, to do? And then you ask yourself, how many schools actually exist, or do we have in Abuja, the federal capital territory, 
in terms of secondary school, in terms of primary school, in terms of the tertiary institution. In my humble opinion, they may not be more than what you have in uh, two or three local governments in Lagos State, uh, for example. So, if you're going to be spending that much and all that, I am not too sure to, mer to merely do innovation. That kind, that kind of expenditure is a job start. I am not saying that we don't have to innovate the schools. All the schools in the federal capital territory that we have seen on television and in pictures and all that are all in bad shape. When, ordinary day, the schools in Abuja, the federal capital territory, to be a model for all the other states uh, of the of the situation and what are they? Well, let's thank God that they are at least thinking of rehabilitating those schools, that the children will no longer have to start sitting under the trees and then um, in the rehabilitated uh, shed, under the rehabilitated shed, to, 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 to stop it. All well, these things affect the psyche of, uh, of the people. But then, I will want to say that um, spending sums of money of that nature on mere innovation uh, leaves uh, much uh, to be desired. We can do better than that. Mm. 30.9 billion. Okay, um, let's take the final headline here. 20 years after, 26 states failed to implement new pension scheme. The riders are federal government, private sector employees benefiting. Experts urge governors to enroll workers. And then pension funds assets hit 17 trillion naira. 26 states fail to implement new pension scheme. What do you have to say about hmm. that? Sorry, where did you pick that? Sorry. In what paper did you pick that? Okay, that's Daily Trust. Daily Trust. Okay, okay. Final put. Yes, I've seen it. 20 hmm. years after. Well, uh, well, uh, 20 years have still to implement new pension scheme. That's uh, been a challenge uh, uh, all the while. Uh, why the states are in reluctant to implement the pension scheme? This is my imagination. Why do I say this? The new pension scheme is called the good pension uh, scheme, in which it is not like the, the mutual benefit scheme that we have in the in the past, or divine benefit scheme that we have in the past, a worker, a percentage of the worker salary will be taken from the worker. And then uh, the government will also uh, put uh, its own counterpart from their needs. And then they then will be sent to some um, uh, pension managers and all that in the country to manage and invest. And then when somebody retires, they are paid uh, from there. But you find that even when these monies are deducted from the worker salary, the local government, the state governments, and others are not limiting to the pension services providers all over the country. In fact, in the past, the federal government and the state government have been toying, and some of them have actually been engaging in in which they take this money and then begin to put it in the coffers of their state in the local government, and then begin to spend the money, so to say on providing infrastructures uh, for the people and what happens. So that when some of these workers retire, and then it is time for them to begin to draw their pensions and what happens, there will be no pension service provider to fall um, uh, back on and what happens. Simply because the states have not been limiting their counterpart, uh, I mean, have not been limiting the funds uh, to the service provider. And you know the new uh, pension schemes like an insurance. If you take an insurance policy and you are not paying your premium as at when do you know that by the time they are needed, the insurance scheme matures and what are you? <laughs> if you go to your insurance uh, uh, provider and then you not begin to redeem your annuity and what are you? You will come back with an empty uh, hand. So let's uh, talk to the state, to the local government, to the federal government. The new pension scheme is easier to implement. They should abide by their own um, uh, laws. They should abide by their own proposal. They should implement this scheme so that when people leave their jobs, I mean, retire, and they are older when they no longer can work, 
they won't be thrown into reactive poverty and on time later that the refusal to implement the pension scheme has been covered. Uh, if you said the old pension scheme was not being religiously implemented because it's difficult, what excuses do the government across the board now have not to be not to implement the new pension scheme? Many the Mount Bulo payment. Corruption and the lethargy and the obduracy and the who is going to ask us to account for this thing is at the bottom of all these things and it is not fair. And imagine what the politicians do. They are in government for four years, they are in government for eight years, and when they are leaving, they are located themselves. Who surveillance car packages? Who uh, surveillance packages? Who hmm? retirement uh, schemes? In terms of all the retirement uh, uh, laws that have been made in all the states for the governor, for the deputy governor, and some other public officers that will merely serve for four years and for eight years. They get their own up front. So why can't the ordinary worker at the local government, at the state, at the federal level, be also treated in a similar way? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, eventually, this is where we're going to wrap up today. Uh, it's been a pleasure, as always, having you join us this morning. Thank you for your thoughts on the headlines. Thanks for having me. Okay. We've been talking with Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner here in Lagos State. We were x-raying the headlines on some of our national dailies. We'll take a break and when we return, we'll be talking with our guests on the, our hot topic this morning. Nigeria records improvement in press corruption perception index under Jimmy. Stay with us. <laughs>